Ed Larson, Pulitzer Prize winner for his book Summer for the Gods, his historical treatment of the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, joined us for our special public television taping. Enjoy this extended interview with Ed there at the Ray County Courthouse. Prior to the Scopes trial, various evangelical Christians, proto-fundamentalists, had accepted a theistic theory of evolution. In the great work, The Fundamentals, most of the authors endorse or say that you can believe in evolution of a kind, as long as God is the designer behind it, a theistic form of evolution. The original American who brought, the original American scientist who brought evolution to America, Darwin's theory to America, was a Trinitarian Christian at Harvard, the only one there, a famous a botanist named Asa Gray, who um, accepted a, the theory of evolution, was the person who brought Darwinism to America, and later gave a very influential series of lectures at Yale Divinity School articulating a theory of theistic evolution that became very influential. And because of his influence as a Trinitarian Christian, uh, many proto-fundamentalist and early um, Christian leaders from the late 1800s, early 1900s, accepted a theory of God involved in using evolution as a means of creation. As one famous one put it, indeed, America's preacher, probably the most famous preacher in America of the late uh, 19th century, was Henry Ward Beecher, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he once said about the theory of evolution, as designed by God, that a God by wholesale is a whole lot more impressive than a God by retail. Great. Okay. Um, the Scopes trial was critical for changing the debate over evolution in America because it was so highly publicized. The issue was already there, it had been building, but the Scopes trial made it front page news and basically roused the forces, the popular forces on both sides, with the evangelicals and fundamentalists pushing for the fundamentals of the face to exclude evolution, any type of evolution, and the modernist Christians and secular forces saying, no, we've got to hold the line and defend science. William Jennings Bryan, an amazing orator, could capture the imagination of the American people, not just American Christians. He could make anything a burning issue if he chose to pick up it and run with it, as he did with many issues over his life. It just turned out his last issue that he picked up was the issue of human evolution and the dangers of human evolution, both the Christian and the popular, secular, cultural problems of believing in human evolution. And he made that an issue across America but especially for Christians. William Jennings Bryan was a political liberal and a religious conservative. He worked those things together by using his Christianity to lead him, like a Wilber, Wilber, Wilberforce of an earlier century, um, like the abolitionists, to bring him to social causes. And those social causes were protecting working men and opposing militarism, rampant militarism and military buildup. So that linked him in many times with political liberals who did not share his religious beliefs, but he came to those from his religious convictions. At the time that Tennessee passed its anti-evolution law, it was already using George Hunter's civic biology textbook. It was the assigned textbook for use everywhere in the state. It was the most popular textbook in the nation. Uh, by far. Uh, this book became a lightning rod. The governor, when he signed the bill, said the bill wouldn't stop using, the book was fine, there was no problem. But when Brian got a hold of it, he saw that it was doctrinally evolutionary. It is an evolutionary textbook. And it includes some controversial features, such as eugenic mating advice for high school students, that they should mate well, and, um, and that leads to a better breed and also included a heavy dose of scientific racism where you have a hierarchy of races. Now that really comes out of his genetics section because the eugenics, the idea that you could breed better humans by selective breeding, was a popular notion at this time endorsed by the Republican president, Calvin Coolidge, and the previous Democratic president, Woodrow Wilson. That grew out, not of Darwinism really, but out of 
the development of Mendelian genetics and the way it had swept across America and became interlinked with evolution. So Darwin's theory can be used to support some of these ideas and Brian saw that as a great opening because he, like many Christians, were opposed to the idea of eugenic breeding. William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow were two larger than life figures. We hardly have a parallel in America today. Clarence Darrow is generally regarded by trial lawyers to this day as the greatest trial lawyer in American history, the one they most admire. He had pioneered various techniques of jury selection and of, of the way you present the closing argument to, to um, lead crusades first to defend labor and then to, in a variety of different causes for civil liberties, uh, civil rights. In addition to the regular collection of murder cases that would come his way as America's greatest trial lawyer. He was also a wildly popular public speaker. Uh, he would go around the country and could fill auditoriums, but so could William Jennings Bryan. After William Jennings Bryan stepped down as Secretary of State, indeed even before that, after his campaigns for president, he was one of the two or three most popular speakers on what was known as the Chautauqua Circuit that would go around the country and give large lectures. He was also a popular lecturer. Now, his had a Christian bent, usually, public policy and Christian bent. Darrow also had a public policy bent, but he questioned the role, publicly questioned the role, sort of the Richard Dawkins of his day, publicly questioned the role of religion and religion in public society. Brian viewed Christianity as the source of peace, the source of love, all that's good in society. Darrow condemned religion as a source of division, a sort of uh, 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 dividing force in America and in the world that, that causes wars. And so their worldviews clash. Now, personally, they were friends. The, uh, Clarence Darrow had supported Brian in his campaigns for president. On many progressive issues, they were allies. They'd known each other for years. But the issue at stake in the Scopes trial drove them apart. And when they were on opposite sides, they were just as vigorous as when they were friends. Remarkably, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow had a similar vision for America in the sense of the public policy, where they should be a more peaceful nation, a more progressive nation, a nation that cared about its workers. But they had a different worldview. They had a different way of getting there. One thought a more scientific view of society, a more secular view of society would get us that way. That was Clarence Darrow. William Jennings Bryan thought we want a Christian nation. Like a Prime Minister William Gladstone in England or a Wilbur, 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 Wilberforce who carried those ideas in England the century before of how Christianity could lead to progressive progress that included everyone. So both cared about people. It was their underlying worldview that led them apart. And so they allied on some things, they divided on others, uh, but they were both articulate spokesmen of their positions and could rouse certain portions of the American population to their side and their causes. Class was a factor at the Scopes trial. William Jennings Bryan always was the great commoner. The, viewed himself as the spokesperson for the working class, for the common people of America. That's how he viewed himself. And he deeply believed in democracy. He thought the people could not be wrong. And that way he was a little bit like Thomas Jefferson, trusting in the common people the voters, and that's how he cast this issue. He said the people don't want evolution taught. They passed this law banning the teaching of human evolution in Tennessee public schools, and that made it right. That was his view of liberty, democracy, that it was tied to majority rule. Clarence Darrow had a very different view. Now, he was even more from the working class than Brian was. Brian grew up sort of in the professional class. Clarence Darrow came from the true working class. His father was an undertaker. Um, 
in, in Ohio, came from a small town in Ohio, and he worked himself up. But he had a view of liberty as tied to individual rights. That the majority would, if given time, given power, would oppress the minority, the smaller groups. Uh, and he, he viewed laws, much Christian-based lawmaking, such as Sunday closing laws, or school prayer laws, or a law against teaching of human evolution in public schools, as just that sort of a law, that the majority was imposing their will on the minority, and his view of liberty was tied to individual rights. That's a historic battle in America going all the way back to our founding. Does liberty come from majority rule, or does liberty come from protecting minority rights? When the Scopes trial occurred, when you had at the Scopes trial Brian, William Jennings Bryan, the great commoner, defending the right of local citizenry to pass any sort of restrictions they want on public school teaching. The elites of America, led by the likes of, of H.L. Mencken, that great writer for the Baltimore Sun and the American Mercury, but others as well, took a very elitist view of what was happening. That here, here's the rabble forming in the countryside and imposing their will, as he once called it, the Huns gathering out there, ready for attacking the citadels of learning. And so many of America's elites joined, joined with the ACLU in fighting this law. They had never joined with the ACLU before because the ACLU was viewed as a radical organization before the Scopes trial. But suddenly you had a lot of establishment conservatives even signing in, the president of Harvard, the president of Columbia, the president of, of Michigan, the president of Stanford, uh, other elites in the American scientific uh, community signing on to work with the ACLU in opposing this law. They even managed to secure Charles Evan Hughes, who had been the Republican nominee for president in 1916, the Republican nominee for president, and would become the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, appointed by a Republican president to be Chief Justice. He was then president of the American Bar Association. They had recruited him to be the lawyer to lead the appellate argument against the Tennessee law should it go to the United States Supreme Court. That's the elites of America tying together, linking together to oppose this law and H.L. Mencken captured that view in the media and took this opportunity to, to ridicule the bumpkins of Tennessee and of Dayton that would pass such a law and try to enforce it. The week of the Scopes trial was like a carnival in Dayton, Tennessee. People poured in, booths were set up, an ox roast behind the courthouse. Uh, monkeys were in um, so people could pose with pictures with monkeys. It was called Monkey Town. It was on the national headlines. It was on broadcast over the radio. It was a carnival up and down Market Street in the side streets, thousands of people poured into Dayton, hundreds of reporters. They'd never seen anything like it. 